investigative journalist and best-selling author who has presented his anti-corruption findings to Canadian law enforcement agencies, military and intelligence officials in the Pentagon, financial and legal professionals, and academics. Cooper graduated with a degree in history, philosophy, and English from the University of Toronto and a certificate in journalism from Langara College before reporting for the province and Vancouver Sun in British Columbia and Global News in Ottawa. He has won a number of awards for narrative reporting and his first book, Willful Blindness, debuted as a number one seller on Amazon in Canada. The revelations and sources developed from this internationally recognized book led to Cooper breaking the PRC interference investigation in the fall of 2022 at Global News. Cooper's groundbreaking reporting on hostile state activity threats to the West, which also includes Iran, India, and Russian threat networks, was subsequently emulated by the Globe and Mail. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Sam Cooper. Thank you so much, Stan. And uh, if you can not hear me fine, give me the thumbs down, but I think I'm okay. And uh, to your community, you know, uh, thank you so much for having me here. I'll speak for about 45 minutes and uh, I'm sure that'll be fun for everyone, but more fun will probably be your questions. And I'm I, there's a lot of big questions out there in Canada right now. Uh, we're experiencing a, a very dark time uh, for our democracy. As all uh, all of you that follow the news closely, uh, I think recognize. But uh, I'm going to walk you through some of the the findings that I've been working on for ten years, and you know to lay out where we are now in Canada. It's my thesis, and I believe mostly proven, although uh, not all of it has come out in any of these recent government reviews. Is that uh, financial crime and organized crime? Uh, has really paved the way for this foreign interference story in Canada. And when we talk about hostile state interference, uh, we're talking first and foremost, uh, China. In my view, uh, of course, India is a new player that uh, Canada knows about now. Uh, the Foreign Interference Commission that you've read about and, and heard about in Ottawa really was forced to recognize India due to my reporting on documents uh, for the Bureau that brought that nation to the forefront and its interference. Many of you will know that Russia traditionally has a has been, uh, it's been long known uh, in Canada that they're, they're up to nefarious tricks with our democracy, but it turns out uh, very recently they're not as interested in Canada. What we haven't heard much about uh, from these uh, revelations in uh, government reviews in Ottawa recently on foreign interference is how central uh, Iran, the Iranian guards, and those networks are to the uh, the very uh, nefarious activities in Canada. But we have had a little glimpse of it. Some of you will have recognized the stories that, that pointed to, uh, hard to believe, but true, Hells Angels gangsters out in British Columbia being hired by Iranian intelligence uh, to go after uh, Iranian diaspora dissidents in United States. And in this, uh, in the case that came out in US uh, government documents, this, it only came to light that the plot involved Canada and Iranian intelligence, because US law enforcement is, uh, has the capacity to, uh, to, to detect and deter and disrupt these networks. Whereas in Canada, I argue uh, that we're wide open to abuse. So I will share my screen and just talk to you a little bit about uh, why and how financial crime, specifically money laundering, uh, I discovered, you know, it was rampant, first of all, in Vancouver, because that is where uh, I came up as a reporter, something, uh, uh, you know, eventually academics coined a term called the Vancouver model. And this was the discovery that Vancouver has become a hub for uh, East Asian Chinese transnational crime to use and abuse Canada's economy. Again, we're focused on Vancouver first, uh, just egregiously. I call it, as you can see in my uh, my notes here, the Canada model, because after I have 
uh, moved in my reporting journey to Ottawa and looked into Toronto, Ontario, I have found that uh, it is the Canada model. It's the Ontario model. But let's focus on Vancouver first. Uh, how big is this problem? I was the first reporter in Canada to expose uh, through my own dot connecting and then government sources that tremendous amounts of money were being laundered through BC government casinos. It turned out that this focused uh, mostly after about 2014 on what we call triads. These are secret transnational uh, East Asian organized crime, crime societies that uh, launder money uh, at the, the most sophisticated and, and I would say highest rate in the world. But Iranian underground banking networks uh, traditionally, as I found out later, were very much involved in Vancouver as well. So how big is the problem? Uh, I estimated a few years ago, it's about $20, mil $20 billion in transactions on Canada's West Coast into real estate every year are coming through illicit some people call them gray market, underground banking channels. And I'll just walk you to uh, the first slide. Again, some of these things I talk about and, and people scratch their heads, some denied them. Uh, but this is what CSIS says. Bottom line, what is going on? Real estate is not the only problem. Demand exists on both sides. What's the demand? Uh, everyone on this uh, chat knows that China, have, for 20, 30 years, people have been talking about the rise of China. People weren't talking too much about, uh, you know, uh, the the really the, the corrosive nature of the Chinese Communist Party weaving into our international trade. That's a very current and, and new topic that I've brought to the surface. But uh, what this FinTrack slide means is that... Uh, People in that massive economy of China face, as you see here, a limit of 50,000 export per year. Uh, many people in China, some for good reasons, a lot of people for bad reasons, want to export their funds out of China. So they need to look for underground channels. This is where the underground banking comes in, which uh, is really organized crime. People talk about gray market banking, community banking, uh, illicit banking, but it's illegal banking, in my view. Uh, it's organized crime, and how it works is through diaspora communities uh, scattered around the world, uh, unfortunately, within the Asian community, uh, for reasons that I'll get into later, uh, something has emerged where uh, this underground banking that fulfills the need to get money out of the Chinese communist system uh, makes... Uh, you know, people doing this underground banking that never touches, uh, you know, uh, well, sometimes it does when it gets more sophisticated, but very often this is cash banking uh, in communities, whether it's uh, the back of a uh, casino, an underground casino, the back of a restaurant. There are piles of cash, as I found in Vancouver, where an organized crime banker has made a deal with someone again on the other side in China who wants to get their cash out of that, that nation and invest perhaps for organized crime reasons in Vancouver real estate. So as I discovered, they make a deal with the underground banker in Vancouver. Let's make it simple. Just say, I want $500,000 in Vancouver. I cannot send it on a legal wire transfer uh, from uh, let's say Shanghai to Vancouver. I'm going to make the deal whether it's a text message or a meeting somewhere else with the gangster, I arrive in Canada and I've made the deal. He he gives me $500,000 in cash in a duffel bag, something like that at a simple level. And very simply, the person that has exported or made the deal to get cash in Vancouver takes that cash, which is drug cash generated from organized crime, walks into the casino, uh, Richmond, British Columbia was uh, a BC government regulated casino was used and abused tremendously. And uh, for reasons that get more complex, uh, but I, you know, to make it simple, organized crime has bought people inside the casino at various levels that make it easy to walk that drug money in, gamble your cash, and then walk out perhaps with a check, perhaps with a uh, cash bundled up to banking standards 
And that's the first step in the money laundering to finish up, you know, why it was called the Vancouver model. An Australian professor said, this is just a industrial scale means of people getting their funds out of China using organized crime who presents cash on the Vancouver side. And the transaction is often completed when the person who has made a deal to get their cash in Vancouver, they gamble. So they've already won. They've laundered their money. What do they do now? They have to pay back the cash inside China, where their source of funds and their bank is. They wire their money straight into a, a banking account controlled by a drug trafficking organization in, uh, let's say, southern China. So this is what uh, became known as the Vancouver model. It's been running at full scale in Vancouver since the 1980s. And uh, it, it really, uh, it, it has coincided with uh, the growth of really a diaspora community that benefits Canada in so many ways, and yet for reasons uh, that get complex in both countries, really is running a parallel economy. And so Vancouver, we see that as I go back to my top line, how much of this money flowing into Vancouver real estate comes through these gray market channels, 20 billion, I estimated through various ways. And uh, that's a pretty conservative uh, number. Is every, every cent of that 20 billion organized crime generated on the China side being laundered through underground banking? Not necessarily. As I said, some people uh, are escaping China for very good reasons and using, unfortunately, underground banking methods to get their money out of China. So whether uh, whether it's a gangster getting the money out or a family that simply wants to escape, unfortunately, I'm saying, uh, due to the nature of China's economy and the people involved in it, it's the underground bankers and organized crime that are benefiting. So I'm going to skip ahead because you're sitting in Toronto, Ontario, and uh, I'm going to jump into a story that I broke and explain to you why it's important. Again, uh, I I broke, uh, you know, the, this model of, of money laundering or underground banking wasn't well known in the Western world, except for experts, until I broke the story about how casinos in British Columbia were uh, abused easily and how, at the same time, real estate in that city of Vancouver Proportionately, uh, we could say that the casinos that were used in this way are the, the literal tip of the iceberg and the real estate market is just has been fed since the 1980s by that funnel of underground cash. So that brings us to uh, Markham, Ontario, where I discovered, as I said, in recent years, the Vancouver model is the Toronto model. The very same underground banking networks are being used Often it's through, uh, again, the East Asian, uh, greater China diaspora community has huge underground banking networks in Toronto. Most recently, uh, FinTrack has reported that uh, one of the fun, or it's not really fun when you think about it, but interesting stories I did was during the pandemic, which Stan mentioned how we all suffered through that uh, ordeal. Well, what else? People couldn't go into casinos in Vancouver uh, where this money laundering was done so easily and flood that money through the casino into real estate. So while the government casinos were closed, this method of Canada model money laundering took leaps and bounds ahead and Toronto Canadian banks, that is our big five, if you say it that way, our big six banks were used in these underground banking networks because the government casinos in British Columbia had been shut down due to the pandemic. What was done now is that people uh, got the same people that are involved in the uh, diasporic underground banking networks. They got people, students, uh, uh, people that didn't have a real job, people that might have faked a job, took out uh, an account in our regulated big banks, and they were just what's known as straw men or nominees, straw persons. Their account is being used for people that were now wire transferring, uh, whether it was drug money or money trying to find uh, you know, corruption money in China, 
money tied to these organized crime networks was being wired in, in, in a more complex way than simply cash gathered in a parking lot and taken to the casino. It's now being wired into these front banking accounts in Toronto and uh, flooding into the real estate market in the same way. And so you may say, are these really big people involved? Well, Canada, I'm arguing, and it's proven, has become a home for international corruption suspects and organized crime. How big is it? Uh, I just, uh, I pick out one name here uh, at the top of my little graph. I'm actually going to go down. There was a U.S. Uh, network that picked up on my investigation. There's a person named Zhao, last name, Jianhua. Now, he had tremendous wealth in China, tremendous wealth. Uh, some people estimate tens to a hundred billion or more. He was, a, how did he generate that wealth? He's what's called in the Chinese system as a white gloves. So he's the person that, uh, he's obviously a very smart person, but financially he's used by the elite of the elite in the Chinese Communist Party, People's Liberation Army, all the officials that secretly you know, control the vast majority of uh, Chinese communist uh, wealth, uh, use people like this person to get their money out and to put it offshore. Offshore has become Canada. The reason is that we don't have, uh, we, we're very weak in financial regulation. As it turns out, uh, in immigration, uh, we, as I've reported, we've become essentially uh, what's called a passport of convenience country. So this person, Zhao Jianhua, ended up uh, having uh, passports in Antigua, a diplomatic passport, a Canadian passport, other passports. And he and his family set up in Markham, Ontario. Uh, and they've, I discovered and reported first for Global News when I was with them, his family is involved in $1.5 billion in Greater Toronto Area real estate development. Why is that a problem? Well, China uh, had, had had thrown him in jail. For a, for a while, we didn't know if he was alive or not, but he was tied up in the corruption of the bigger people behind him that aren't really named. So what we have here is a person, uh, a, a money launderer of the highest level for China's corrupt elites, uh, for some reason, he got into trouble with the Ron people in China. He was kidnapped from Hong Kong and put away in uh, incommunicado for a long time. Apparently, we do know he's alive, but his family somehow got uh, got access to at least a good portion of the money that he has offshore. $1.5 billion isn't a small chunk of change. And I'll keep it simple here, but I want to... Uh, the point here is that whether we're talking about uh, China, Russia, or Iran, you've all seen that very recently, uh, Mr. Trudeau, after five or six years, uh, sanctioned the Iranian guards. It's the very same problem in Canada. We have people of the corrupt elite from Iran, China, Russia, most dangerously right now, China and Iran, set up in real estate in Toronto and Vancouver, Montreal, and how do they get uh, you know, their funds out through these underground banking channels? So I'm gonna flip over to uh, the Markham Casino story that I broke. And you may ask yourself, how does this connect to, um, you know, can you concretely connect the uh, China interference story to this underground banking that you're talking about uh, to the People's Republic uh, corruption or attempts to corrupt our politician. And I'm saying, yes, some of you will remember looking at this picture. I'm just going to pop this out and let a picture tell a few thousand uh, words here. So in the middle, some of you remember where my cursor is, this massive alleged underground casino. Why is Mr. Trudeau in the picture? Look at my cursor down here. Why is our former public safety minister, Bill Blair, in the picture? Over here, who's Mr. Trudeau shaking hands with? Why have I felt the confidence to place that above, you know, a bundle of cash? This cash was uh, seized from this underground casino, which was running brazenly, again, during the pandemic. Remember, 
the British Columbia Center of Money Laundering in North America for Asian Organized Crime and Chinese Communist officials uh, was shut down. So this, uh, you know, palace of corruption, as the York Regional Police called it, popped up. It was operating just brazenly in broad daylight. That in itself, uh, you know, look at this cash, a million C's. Look at these weapons. There's a Desert Eagle, a Magnum, uh, I believe an AR-15. That's bad enough. Everyone hate, well, not everyone. People are fascinated by organized crime, but when you see your cars disappearing off the streets of Toronto, um, it'll start to bother you. When you see people dying of fentanyl overdoses, it'll, it'll start to bother you. You start to ask, what is the wealth behind these mansions, you know, in, in various portions of the city? Well, the generation of wealth, as York Regional Police say, is uh, uh, both the casinos generate wealth, uh, they generate a lot of wealth for prostitution, human trafficking, drug trafficking, they generate a lot of violence. And as my story showed, the angle here is this person, I'm just going to see my cursor, little Chinese flag popping out over his head. Of course, there's our prime minister next. He, the, the person standing in front of the Chinese national flag, is the alleged owner, runner, one of them, one of the interests in this casino. So here he is in 2016, an alleged uh, organized crime figure from Anhui province in China, meeting with our prime minister. We don't need to name all these people. I don't think I'll name any of them today, but uh, the man in purple, it's been established, proven through documents, that a meeting was set up between him and Mr. Trudeau. You see them shaking hands here, and there's a little, I don't think I'll need to read that. Basically, uh, you know, I can go into a Chinese language uh, government-controlled website and talk about how this individual, Mr. Trudeau, supposedly met and uh, agreed how China and Canada should share knowledge through think tanks, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, this person, in the purple tie, who is he? He works for what I've termed, and many of you now know, is Beijing's United Front Work Department, their overseas influence arm, the uh, the system that in the Chinese election interference story is surrounding our politicians. You know, I say flooding the zone. China has un very unfortunately taken over grassroots community groups, many people that immigrated to Canada to uh, live a better life, escape communism, Beijing. The whole point of the Chinese election interference story is uh, Chinese secret police and their hired thugs in organized crime have taken over community groups, tasked them through this almost $3 billion per year funded United Front Work Department, which floods money into our country to pay for these operations to surround our, our, our politicians like our prime minister so they can meet together and, you know, they have their private discussions. And as uh, I, the Globe and Mail and others have reported, these are called cash for access meetings. So what's the nature of the cash? What's the nature of what's discussed in the access? There's a lot, there's lawsuits going on right now. But I think if you look at these pictures, there's enough there to tell you that um, the people that Mr. Trudeau is meeting with are not good people. I'm not going to say all of them. I'm going to say every person, including Canadian politicians, that I haven't that I've shown in this photo is either uh, being uh, named as a Chinese intelligence official, uh, can be connected officially to a United Front Work Department group, is a Canadian politician who very obviously is directly meeting with in fundraising scenarios, either organized crime suspects. Chinese officials, secret Chinese intelligence officials. And I'm saying, I'm not, uh, with confidence, I'm saying all of them can be connected to uh, illicit activities, Beijing front groups, and, uh, and organized crime. It can't be avoided. This is the nature of the network. I'm just going to 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 square uh, or, or to close the circle on that one. This story was, you know, about... A lot of you have read about the 2019 and uh, 2021 election through my methods of uh, connecting fundraising documents, meeting documents like the one you see here, and with some of the classified information that 
I was provided by people in the government that were so concerned about this activity, I could make certain connections and go further than uh, other people and uh, report. You know, the whole point of this story about the casino was it was not just an organized crime facility. CSIS, our Canadian intelligence uh, agency, had heard from the York Regional Police that York Regional Police had captured some video and visual evidence inside this mansion of pleasure. The concern was Canadian politicians were visiting this mansion of pleasure. I reported that uh, York Regional Police and CSIS feared that Canadian politicians could it be exposed to com uh, compromising uh, activities. Let's just leave it at that. What's going on inside this uh, mansion? York Regional Police said it was a body house. Human trafficking is involved. They point to uh, the funds possibly being connected to generating you know, drug trafficking operations. Very obviously, weapons, cash, Chinese officials. There's just too many uh, weeds to get into, as they say, to tell you how many bad things are happening inside. But CSIS believed this was a Chinese intelligence operation both Chinese civilian intelligence, likely Chinese military intelligence was connected to it, according to my sources. And CSIS wanted to do a big investigation on this story. Uh, sorry, this uh, th they wanted to go beyond the crime side and get into the foreign interference side. They believed this would shed light on the, uh, the federal election interference story. But without getting into too many details, in a very strange, bizarre way, the case fell apart. And uh, the end of the story is CSIS did not get to, uh, to, to collect the video evidence that York Regional Police wanted to share with them. So I am going to, before getting a little bit into Iran, before um, you know, taking your questions, again, I won't say names here, but Look at this. We've got, I'm just going to read you something again, because everyone's focused on the 2019 election. Remember, Justin Trudeau's elect uh, becomes leader of the Liberal Party in 2013. 2016, he starts showing up at these grip and grins with uh, what I'm saying with confidence are organized crime suspects and Chinese intelligence assets and, and you know, uh, generating funds for his party through these cash for access meetings whether there were quid pro quos, again, there's lawsuits going on, but uh, you can read up a, a, a lot on cash for access because the Globe and Mail and I, in my book, have reported plenty about it. But why am I showing you this picture? 2015, star candidate Bill Blair, you know, from Scarborough, shows up at a fundraiser. John McCallum was uh, kind enough to write on Facebook the evidence, I'm calling it, Thank you to everyone that came out and supported our fundraiser last night. Should be August 20, 2015. There, you know, there are abouts. He's talking about how uh, Team Trudeau will benefit from an amazing night. Again, uh, won't get into too much detail. For people that like evidence, a huge part of our success last night was in thanks to our special guest, former Chief Police Bill Blair, who did an amazing speech. McCallum wrote in his Facebook post, adding election 42, Team Trudeau. Why does it matter? Okay. Again, lawsuits are going on. I won't talk about everyone that was at that meeting. I can guarantee you the police care about it. I know they do. But here is our, our Prime Minister sitting beside an individual that the Globe and Mail call uh Justin Trudeau's chief liberal ambassador to deep-pocketed Chinese Canadians. If you remember back to uh, recognize, recognize the face, uh, he's the person, you know, at the very first picture in the story, at that cash for access meeting with an organized crime suspect, a Chinese united front uh, figure, et cetera, et cetera. But he, he was, uh, he's, I believe the co-chair for fundraising for, for the Liberal Party of Canada in 2014, 2015. He was an official in the Wynn Liberal government in Ontario. There he is. You, we could call him Trudeau's maybe left-hand man if we're looking at it that way in the community, 
He's the guy that that makes sure many people come out at these uh, whatever they are, five hundred dollar per plate. You know, for the exclusive ones, fifteen hundred dollars per plate, two hundred dollars per plate, or who knows what it was at this room here with hundreds of people, maybe maybe a thousand or so. But why does it matter? So many things go through people like people like that person who I'm not going to name, but I'm just going to I'll read you something. Many of you have read Globe and Mail stories about wiretaps, some of my own, my own, they're all sensitive, but uh, so most of you who follow it closely will recognize the individual named Wei Zhao, who was uh, ejected from Canada as persona non grata after it was revealed that he had been uh, targeting MP Michael Chan and his family. That is, he's a Chinese intelligence undercover in uh, the Toronto consulate. A senior intelligence source uh, uh, who should be very important to the stories you've read from myself and, and quite possibly the Globe and Mail told me this before I started breaking stories in 2022. This person who's sitting beside Trudeau, it comes up on a wiretap call. And so uh, the person, let's not make it too complicated. This guy that got kicked out, Wei Zhao, talks to someone in the in the Toronto consulate. Uh, he says, can I meet this person who's sitting beside Justin Trudeau? Of course, he didn't put it this way. His friend inside the consulate said, uh, this is a sensitive political contact of the consulate that we try not to use too often, who can assist us in certain political matters. This is what a senior intelligence official responsible for much of what you now know about uh, interference in Canada told me. Furthermore, as I write here, and I'm gonna highlight the quote, I'd say as a major fundraiser, he can influence decisions of senior members of the Liberal Party of Canada. This is a large and very entrenched network of individuals that is bigger than we imagine that have significant influence. How close the influence? Sitting next to our prime minister. You know, he's the guy here. He's a campaign co-chair when Bill Blair is there. Other people at this uh, at this uh, event in August 2015, I connected in this story to the illegal casino network. And let's just go back to that that picture of uh, Mr. Trudeau cannot be separated from this activity because he's meeting the people involved in this activity. So that, I'll end my, as I've said, China is the number one threat here. But before I get to questions, um, I didn't even really, you know, it was after I broke stories about Chinese election interference that the case that I had broken my book, Willful Blindness, of a RCMP's top in intelligence uh, it official prior, a man named Cameron Ortis, uh, was revealed to be uh, a traitor. He, a person working with organized crime, convicted now across Canada, organized crime at the highest levels, and I'll just I'll just show you what I found out in his case is that uh, I knew the allegations where Cameron Ortis was working with uh, the highest levels of international Iranian Middle Eastern organized crime. And I didn't know how much money these people were responsible for laundering. But once it came out, uh, once the trial went forward, even Ortis himself, uh, through a crafty sort of legal argument that failed, uh, acknowledged that the people that he claimed to be doing a sting operation, he was not. The people that he was working for and with and trying to get payoffs from are the highest level, uh, you know, Hezbollah operatives, Iranian organized crime. Uh, the case, uh, the, the Ortis case revealed that one person in Toronto that ran a currency exchange, one of these ones you see in North Toronto, there's many Iranian diasporic uh, you know, uh, financial trading shops. And uh, one person was responsible for allegedly over $3 billion in suspicious transactions. That's one person. Other people in the network, uh, large amounts. Without getting into two names, too many names, I'm just going to pop out this, uh, this RCMP document that came out in the file. He, uh, what does this first line say? It shows that essentially in 2014, 
it came out in trial that uh, Cameron Ortis, in his intelligence role, was privy to all this high-level intelligence that he ended up trying to sell to these people that are using Canada. But we just see uh, one of these persons in, in the investigation, it says, mother is pivotal in operations research. That was uh, the RCMP elite intelligence unit in their file, links to Hezbollah. Let's just go to the very bottom line, operations research breach to redacted Canadian Border Services Agency uh, employee. We go down, down, down. CBSA has an interest in another person, Medizade, from a counter-proliferation perspective. What is counter-proliferation? Uh, it relates to uh, our, our senior sort of intelligence and law enforcement agencies' concerns that people are involved in the, in the production of uh, high-level weapons for Iran or Hezbollah or, you know, things that are going on in the Middle East right now. And so uh, what I really learned that I didn't know in the Cameron Ortis case was I knew uh, Iranian organized crime, Middle Eastern organized crime was up there, right up there, as my sources said, with uh, Asian transnational organized crime and uh, Mexican cartels are the top level organized crime operators in Canada which is bad enough. Two or three years ago, people wouldn't have believed that, you know, they maybe they're still looking back to the 80s or 90s and think that, you know, bikers and uh, Italian organized crime are running, running, running the show in Canada. But no, what we've learned is uh, China, Iran, Hezbollah, Mexican cartels are, are using our cities, our economies easily. As I've said, tens of billions per year laundered in uh, Vancouver, tens of billions per year, Toronto, Montreal, over a hundred billion dollars per year pouring through Canada's economy uh, because we're a weak link. But again, uh, that, you know, crime is bad. <laughs> Cars disappearing in your neighborhood, bad. Fentanyl, bad. But my key argument here is just like the casino story that I showed you, just like this story that I'm showing you, these organized crime networks are the ones that are involved in uh, corrupting our politicians, whether it be for India, whether it be for people that are fighting India and Canada, whether it be for Iran and Hezbollah, whether it be Iran intelligence hiring the Hells Angels, a lower level criminal organization now in Canada to go after uh, dissidents in North America. Uh, this is why I argue that uh, there's a crisis now in Ottawa. People, uh, media that may not quite under the, understand the story are demanding, you know, tell us the names. Tell us the names of these politicians that are allegedly colluding with foreign governments. And I'm saying if people really understand it, they'll be saying, tell us the names of these very sophisticated organized crime actors that we can see in our communities that are developing real estate at large scale in our cities, tell us their names and let's connect the politicians to them. You can see it in photos. I've showed you photos today. There will be your answers. Organized crime from these hostile states and Mexico and Latin America, which are working with them, uh, are the key to this story. And so I've reached about uh, 45 minutes and I'll take your questions, you know, for, for as long as we can go here. Thank you so much, Sam. If you have any questions, you can uh, type it into the chat and I'll I'll feed Sam the, the questions. We did have one question uh, to start off with, but I'll just give you a minute to just uh, think if you have any questions. It was fascinating. Okay, let me just see. questions 
Okay, Sam. So um, we have our first question. Just give me a minute. What is the challenge in charging Trudeau, Wynn, and others with corruption? Well, <clears throat> I'm not alleging that um, Justin Trudeau knows that he took uh, money, which can likely be connected to organized crime. Perhaps uh, he, he could claim that he had no idea prior to this meeting that this individual would end up being charged a few years later for this, you know, egregious activity. We see, if you're looking at my share screen, uh, the casino, see the weapons, the cash seized, see the politicians meeting uh, inside this illegal casino connected to the highest levels of Asian organized crime, the highest levels of Chinese intelligence working with Asian organized crime. You ask, uh, why could uh, an individual like Mr. Trudeau or, or, or former public safety minister Bill Blair not face charges? RCMP would need to be able to prove. Uh, again, I'm not a lawyer. I wanted to be one at, at a time, and I work on legal issues a lot. But I think pretty clearly RCMP would have to prove that Mr. Trudeau uh, knowingly uh, took some money from an individual he knew or should have known had generated funds from organized crime and provided something back in return. That's called a quid pro quo. So that's a simplistic way to look at it. In the United States, there have been cases of politicians that uh, that that were caught on FBI video uh, you know, shaking hands uh, with people inside uh, hotel rooms, ab scam for some of you people. Uh, there was a Hollywood movie made out of it. Fascinating how like casino licenses in New Jersey, you know, tied into uh, people getting, uh, you know, uh, immigrating to the country. And there was a big sting operation. It revealed how people were for sale at Congress, etc. But before you know, giving you the impression that that same thing could happen in Canada, even if this could be proven, shockingly, you know, until uh, two weeks ago, maybe I guess it was, we didn't have uh, a foreign influence act where uh, what I've shown, what I've suggested in this is, you're not going to find an official from Beijing necessarily in Ottawa shaking hands with a, a party leader and saying, we're going to donate to you if you uh, put this legislation forward or you don't stand up and uh, accuse us of a genocide in Xinjiang, it would be very difficult to prove that. But the whole nature of the story is people, perhaps people in this meeting are community leaders who are called proxies who get together in these, uh, you know, private exclusive fundraising meetings and we don't know exactly what's discussed there. You know, are there deals or suggestions that you're going to get some a good amount of donations if you know a bank license is approved uh, this year, or if you know uh, Huawei gets to put a you new know, kind of research development facility out in UBC, or if this bank you know opens a big hub in Vancouver and has a merger with a Canadian bank that's going out of business, this kind of thing. I'm throwing out some possibilities here. And to answer your question without, without scrambling or getting too complex, we didn't have the laws in place to, uh, to, to convict these people, even if it were proven that they shook hands uh, knowingly with a gangster and, and got money flowing into their party's coffers to help them get elected. But I believe um, it's known by people that follow this closely. My work has, has helped shine a light on this activity, we now have a law that, uh, in theory, if it's proven that one of these proxies was used by Iran, you know, was used by India, was used by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, most importantly, nothing really matters, I'm saying, except for was used by Beijing to influence our leaders. Uh, conceivably, uh, they people could be charged. I'll end my answer here. Uh, 
some of you know, you know, all these acronym reports have come out. The NSI COP 2024 review into the reporting that I led the way on for Canada when I was uh, with the TV company before starting my own brand uh, in the past year. This report said Canadian politicians have knowingly or through willful blindness accepted transfers from foreign missions or their proxies that were layered or concealed to disguise their origins, right? So uh, look, if, if we want to think we live in a, a good first world nation, we need the laws in place that if Canadian politicians knowingly accept money laundering like trans transactions from foreign states through proxies, which I'm saying are involved in organized crime, yeah, they should be charged. Okay, and the same person is also asking why at a minimum, um, you know, the association of these political figures isn't broadcasted very loudly? It's a good question. I have a few answers. I mean, um, I'll tell you this, I've been working on this kind of file for 10 years. I led the way on this file. It's not easy work. I've faced uh, and fa I, I have faced <laughs> and survived and continue to face uh, lawsuits for reporting this type of activity. You know, when we're just looking at this photo of this egregious sort of meeting and, and the, the activities criminal underlying, you know, some of the people, at least one of them in the picture, um, you know, major lawsuits can stem from the media exposing these, these, uh, exclusive fundraising meetings. So I would say that there's the there we could say that Canadian media is not, you know, the 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 probing, rigorous and curious uh forceful institution it should be. We could also say that uh media is uh you know, it, it's not a surprise to anyone that it's been going downhill with the, the rise of the internet for two decades now and doesn't have, you know, a lot of funds to, to not only to, you know, deploy reporters to, to dive into these time intensive and intellect intensive stories. Uh, they're also very legally, as I'm suggesting, intensive and cost intensive. So there's a few reasons. Okay, very interesting. Okay, and our next question, what do you see as the remedy to uh, presence and activities of foreign bad actors in the country? Introducing government policy, strengthening law enforcement, investigating intelligence agencies? Yeah, the remedy is uh, first and foremost, I would say awareness of the Canadian population and focus, uh, intensive political focus of the type that would uh, generate a type of election result as such as the one you saw, was it a day ago in Toronto, uh, a stunning result. That's indicating, you know, a level of displeasure with the current government. I can't, I, I, I doubt that you'd attribute all of that, certainly, to foreign, foreign interference, doubtful. Maybe you could attribute, you know, a, a big part of that result to a certain community, probably this one, if there were voters there and are asking, you know, why are they now facing um, deep threats to their community uh, from, from, you know, groups that would seem to have, you know, a lot of connectivity to, to the Middle East in a very aggressive way. I'm saying that probably uh, without scrambling from the question, I mean, um, what it'll take, the remedy is political will. We've seen it can happen. I'm suggesting probably foreign interference caused some people uh, in, in, in the Toronto by-election to realize they're not feeling safe. They think the government is just, has been talking nonsense while not, you know, um, not taking action against these networks I'm talking about, uh, that the type that could sponsor you know, attacks on the Jewish community. And uh, that party was punished for not taking action. I'm, I think foreign interference and uh, the, the community's disgust with the lack of the response probably can tap into that election result. So what, what will happen, you know, within a year if it's not, you know, people's 
distaste with whatever happened in in the pandemic or it's not uh you know other issues but people really cared about foreign interference and they 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 couldn't get over their shock that we now know people a number of par parliamentarians are allegedly working for foreign states and we can't do anything about it then they would you know metaphorically speaking they they'd be in the streets saying we want not just a foreign influence registry we want a deep rigorous overhaul of whatever it is in the constitution of this country or the the law courts the jam up that doesn't allow Canada, you know, to prosecute this activity that allows our sovereignty to be threatened, that allows our communities to be threatened. And I'm not just talking about one community. What the foreign interference story has revealed is that, you know, hostile states will try to control what they see as their diaspora. It's just so wrong headed, but they Literally, there are life safety threats. Uh, I've talked about that in, in North America because this stuff has gone too far. So it's political will and it's going to be voter uh, voter voters standing up at the end of the day because I'll tell you this, it's not just you know changing a few laws. It goes a lot deeper than that. Anyone that's tried to change a law and get a result knows that it's not easy and it's going to be a number of laws, but I believe a deeper a deeper attention to what's wrong with our legal system and our political system. Okay, thank you so much. And um, our next question it has to do with our, our universities and specifically what's going on right now um, in the Middle East. And you touched a little bit on foreign interference with um, funding to these universities and essentially what we're teaching our young people. Uh, so can you comment a little bit on what we can do to, you know, sway our our new generation of university students into realizing what is going on and realizing that, you know, maybe all their professors are not, um, you know, are not exactly who we would like them to be? Yeah, I mean, I think that's been ever, ever since people recognized that that Russia is up to a lot of no good in, in our society, uh, talking about North America, then people start to recognize that just within academia, sort of a protected space where it used to be for free expression, uh, to the point where, you know, if you were if you were a Russia or a China, you could quite easily sponsor, you know, and influence academics. And so those are people that, uh, you know, to a very large extent, start to get a big voice within the university community because they're protected, you know, our concept of academic freedom. Uh, and so these people uh, do, uh, I remember as a university student, it's almost shocking that you very quickly, your whole worldview is challenged. And, and maybe, you know, a lot of people it's easy, it's easy enough to get brainwashed. And so I do think that's happening. And very ironically, it's got to the point where perhaps the, the foreign state influence within that protected academic freedom circle has gotten so large, so intensive. When I'm talking about, you know, the United Front or uh, it's, you know, much smaller, but, but equally intrusive sort of uh, think tank or intelligence or charity front group, you know, related entities from the Middle East or Russia, flooding funds into Canada, influence media to influence professors. It's gotten to the point, as everyone here knows, in North America, that our universities are not about free speech. They're about, uh, you know, enforced speech from those people that used that circle of freedom to get in there and then enforce their, you know, their view of the world. So that's what we see, you know, to think visually, you can see them now on our campuses with that, you know, shabby looking fence around it uh, with, you know, some people, some, some well-intentioned young people that think they're representing, you know, uh, for rights in another par area of the world, probably not realizing that there are hardened operatives, funded operatives within those camps. So that's one point. But I mean, um, I do think uh, 
what's going on in the universities. Uh, if anyone thinks that's, you know, organic uh, young people just, you know, uh, or, or, you know, labor unions, people that tend to lean to the left kind of expressing themselves, you're in for just, uh, I don't know, maybe you still believe in Santa Claus because this united front that I'm describing funded at almost 3 billion US dollars per year, you can go to the New York Times and read how uh, the United Front uh, through, you know, some socialist tycoon has been funding, uh, you know, these sort of uh, uh, protests on campuses. And that that's bringing me to another point that uh, when you when you're talking about China, when you're talking about Iran, Russia, North Korea, uh, we're going into a very dark point in time where uh, we can call that the new axis, right? Th these are the, the hostile states that uh, are, believe, I believe, they think they're already at war with the West. This is what some people call hybrid war. We could say that's what's happening on campuses, trying to leverage your, uh, your society, your elites uh, through protest to um, take a certain position in the Middle East. We can already see, if you're following my theory, how that could have um, chiseled Canada off uh, from, from you know, our traditional position where we would have been closer, <laughs> we would have been with our allies, including the United States. I'll end by saying what we can say to our young people. I mean, it's a sensitive topic, but uh, young people are not, I mean, they're, they're it, people will always have the same intelligence, but people are not, if you're not being taught to um, read and investigate for yourself, and you're being taught to consume a complex topic through a Chinese uh, social media app, you know, called TikTok or something, um, there's a lot of people that now get their worldview through what uh, I know is a, uh, is, a massive uh, hostile state operation, which we can quite easily already, I believe, see that this is a way for a foreign state that would be probably, you know, deep down, hand in hand with Iran, hand in hand with wanting to see uh, Hamas successful in in Hamas successful in the Middle East, uh, pr uh, propagating those viewpoints to our young people on the campuses. So it's just getting more complex with social media. And it's more than that professor, uh, the, uh, the cool um, Marxist that you need to worry about. Wow, very scary. Um, and our, our next question is, why the Conservative Party isn't putting this information on billboards? Like, wh why do we not hear anything about this from the Conservative Party? Are they also guilty? I mean, I'm glad you asked that because <clears throat> no party, no major party at any level of uh, government in Canada is not uh, exposed to this foreign interference. Uh, if I'm giving the impression that the Liberal Party is most exposed and compromised, that's the impression I want to give, because they are. But, but the Conservative Party, uh, which very clearly will be our next government, barring, you know, I don't know, something apocalyptic, I can tell you because I know they have exposure. They've got, uh, I'm not gonna name names um, at this point, but they, they're targeted in the same way and they will have vulnerabilities, you know, to other states, but certainly to China, not even close to the Liberal Party for whatever reason. I don't, you know, we don't have enough time to get into my evidence or theories on why um, Trudeau and other Liberal Prime Ministers are so, I'm just going to say, uh, look so compromised. Um, the point here is that everyone is surrounded. Let's just focus on China because they're the main threat. Uh, everyone is surrounded by these community groups that tragically have been um, subjected to Chinese police, secret police pressure and control in a democracy to the point where people fear living in Canada and just this mass surrounding of our politician with people throwing money at them for influence to buy complex influence in the future to try to get people promoted into minister positions or the prime minister's office our next government will be targeted in the same way already is targeted um so it'll be up to the leader i believe 
uh, it'll be up to if, if Pierre Polyev is the next prime minister. I mean, I don't think he can do worse than the current one on foreign interference. And hopefully that's not his uh, threshold. Hopefully, if he is the next prime minister, he's taking everything that comes out seriously. And he knows he's got vulnerabilities, too. I believe that. Very, uh, very interesting viewpoint. Um, our next question um, is, could your skill be applied to investigating foreign funding of the current sit-ins and pro-Palestinian protests? It, seem, it seems clear that foreign actors prepared for October 7th. Yeah, you know, I, that that's, that's a topic that I've been looking for um, building up my knowledge. I mean, the Cameron Orris case, I believe, set the groundwork for, you know, showing how important, uh, tremendously sophisticated organized crime that I believe works together with these Chinese networks, how powerful that is in our Canadian city, ci cities and how that has to translate into influence operations on our politicians and real life, uh, real death maybe concerns in our communities and in your community from people funded uh, to maybe uh, to, to be marching through neighborhoods that, that this should not be happening in Canada. So they, the, the answer is I'm looking at ways into it and you know I'm gonna in the next, actually this week, I'll be interviewing uh, one of my former colleagues, just a brilliant uh, Iranian Canadian journalist named Negar Moteji. She is the one that exposed how deeply uh, embedded Iranian guard tycoons were across our, across Canada. And she is going to talk about on a video podcast that I'll present uh, how this ties into um, the, uh, let's just call it, uh, not organic protests happening on our campuses, why people are marching through Jewish neighborhoods threateningly, I believe she'll argue that this connects into these very sophisticated uh, and nefarious uh, Iranian intelligence and regime networks that have been allowed to embed in Canada. And uh, I will look for opportunities to not only, you know, platform people like her with her expertise and her access, you know, to officials in Israel, but I'm looking for uh, ways to devote more of my time to looking into how um, sort of uh, the Iranian regime networks blend into what I'm talking about here, but not just that, uh, focusing on them specifically. So I, I do plan to focus more and more on that. Thank you very much, Sam. This has been really eye-opening and very, very interesting. I know I've learned a lot. I'm sure uh, we all have. I wanted to to thank you on behalf of uh, our entire Adith Israel community and on behalf of our entire Jewish community for doing the kind of work that you do. And uh, yes, this has been really great. I've already gotten multiple positive feedback from participants on this call. So thank you very much, Sam. Thank you very much, uh, Stan Grossman, for bringing Sam Cooper into uh, one of our programming. You do wonderful work. And to everybody else, we hope you attend our future programs and Thank you very much. And uh, oh, I think we just got one more question. Oh, there's just another thank you for uh, for all the work that you do. So yeah. thank you very much and have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Hope to see you in person sometime. Thank you so much. Have a good night.